Greetings, ladies and mantle gents, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from Outer Space. 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 And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Story number one. Healing plus lightning equals wizard launcher. Written by In Babylon They Wept. Avalon was already halfway through the anti-lightning sigil when he realized that the hedge wizard spell was continuing. Surprising. Dual elemental spells were rare enough amongst polished circle elves, but a backward self taught like the human in front of him. They were signs of a prodigy. Still, it was hardly worth noting for someone with centuries of experience. He simply relooped his hand instead of closing his fist, preparing himself to charge his sigil with the second element in turn. Or so he thought. His almost bored counterspelling was replaced by consternation. The first spell he'd identify clearly enough, Aerothurgy of the Third Ring, a lightning blast designed to cripple warriors by overdrawing their muscles. A typical for wizard jewels, but perhaps the hedge wizard was trying to avoid lethal options. He would be disappointed if he expected the same courtesy from Avalon himself. But the second spell he'd never seen used in a duel before it was a biomancy spell, but far more intricate than the lightning spell. At least the sixth ring. He'd seen something like it used to reattach severed tendons. Why would he try to heal me right after harming me? The hedge wizard maintained focus as he traced the last symbols through the air, completing the cast. Avalon closed his fist and finished his sigil, protecting from the lightning part of the attack. If there was a look of trepidation on the hedge wizard's face as he finished, Avalon assumed that it was fear from fighting a superior mage. He assumed wrong. There was a sound like a rigging of a ship tearing loose, like a mighty cord breaking under unimaginable strain. The hedge wizard howled in pain, but more important than that, he flew! Avalon had no time to cast a physical barrier. He'd been prepared for lightning and thunder, not for the filthy half-feral man to cross the thirty-foot gap between them in half a second. His brain was still trying to process how the healing plus lightning resulted in a wizard launcher. The wizard slammed into him with a waist level, a dagger, sharp shoulder aimed perfectly at his diaphragm. The sound he made as every fragment of the air left his body was similar to the noise a rat would make while getting run over by an ox cart. The two bounded down the road, the Gordian knot of limbs and robes. Avalon may have been caught unprepared for the dive tackle, but he wasn't completely useless in a scrap. His reflexes were still top-notch, and even when he couldn't tell up from down, he could still cast a ward against blows. The hedge wizard was definitely slower and smaller than Avalon himself was, but if nothing else, he was in his element. Avalon managed to throw a few sharp elbows into his ribs, but when the scramble stopped, the human was the one on top. The sigil was not focused enough to full stop the first blow, but it softened it. His head still bounced back against the grass, but it was hardly the crushing blow that the hermit had clearly hoped for. The second blow was also warded, but still went hard enough to draw a trickle of blood from one nostril. He tracked the recoil fist of the human wizard and was surprised to see a large rock clutched in his palm. He must have snatched it off the path at some point during the tumble. Sly, little bastard. He did have an ace of his own, a little trick built into every ward he cast. Wrapped it all in a defensive cast, he always threw in an energy trap, a way to turn the enemy's strength against him. Between the tumbling and the punches, the physical ward was practically shimmering with built-up charge. He released it with a snarl. The edge had no time to react. One second he was trying to pummel Avalon to death with a rock, the next he was physically thrown ten feet back. If he'd have landed on his back, Avalon would have had enough time to finish him off with his ice spear. But the stupid, grimy, wicked little beast landed on both feet and charged forward like a bull. Centuries of knowledge, analyzed in fractions of a second, spells, wards, sigils, could be cast before the human crossed the gap. Only one choice. He swung a haymaker at the human's jaw. His mind worked faster than his arm could alter the course as he watched in slow motion horror as the human twisted his head and ducked, taking the blow on the forehead instead of the chin. 
Avalon's punch had more power than sense behind it, and decades of sedentary life had made him soft. He barely had time to wince at the boxer's fracture he gave himself before he felt the little man's arms wrap around him. Surprisingly, from behind, he must have managed to slide under his leg. As he reached down to break the vice-like grip the human had, he realized that the human's fingers were twitching the same lightning spell that they had before. He'd been too busy fighting for his life to process what the hell that opening move had been. But in a split second, he realized what was about to happen. The human didn't use lightning spells to attack directly. He used them on himself as a way to overload his muscles and gain a temporary and painful burst of super strength. The healing was just used to fix whatever horrible damage he did to his own muscles in that moment. Twitching stopped, and he knew that the convocation was complete. He could only sit in silent horror, as he felt every muscle in the human's body punch together in one powerful pulse. The arms around his waist crushed together like a vice, harm enough to snap at least two of his lower ribs. He felt his feet lift off the ground and his muscles in the human's back pulled taut, saw the ground rush up to meet him as he was flung carelessly over the human's shoulder. It wasn't a clean knockout. It was a filthy, vicious, visceral knockout. And in the human's eyes, that was far better. The hedge wizard spent a few seconds on the ground, quietly contemplating his choice to pull every muscle from his hamstrings to his shoulders. He didn't have enough mana to fix himself right as rain, but he could work up enough to at least get himself onto his feet again. He took a moment to drag the unconscious elf into the shade under a tree before rummaging around the finely tooled leather bag. There was a bag of candied nuts that had helped himself to, as well as a small bottle of brandy, but the rest he left be. He liked these creature comforts, but he wasn't a bandit. He just wanted to make a point about what happened to people that tried to barge through his woods, only to threat of violence when told to leave. He couldn't tolerate buddies, but he especially couldn't tolerate bullies blessed with magic. Still, he felt a little bad for his petty theft and slightly impressed with the physicality of the fight. He hemmed and hawed for a few seconds before fishing through his pack again, this time pulling out a quill and some parchment. Using one of the hardbacks in the bag as a desk, he wrote a small note to leave to the unconscious elf's lap. I say, Maker, you can travel through, provided that you bury your shites. When you return to your very fancy circle, try to read a book on how to not get suplexed. <laughs> Signed, uh, Tombug. Yes, you're decent enough for a book wizard. I guess you can stop by again, if you behave. Bet your friends are pricks, though. Tell them to stay away, or I'll have to kill them with a rock. End of story. Story number two. Human imagination is precious. Written by Fox Corp. A lone radio dish peers into the cosmos constantly screaming out, asking, begging to be found. For a century it has screamed into the void and countless possible habitable worlds. Yet, no one has yelled back. The humans who operate the machine sit in solace and isolation. They worry about things no other species could dream of, think of new solutions to questions only they could ask. While they learn nothing of our existence, we are simply too nervous about changing them. For all those years, we have listened, seen, and found. What we see on that little blue marble is the most ingenious people of all space. They haven't, throughout their history, stopped asking questions of themselves. With ravenous hunger, they tear apart things around them, not to destroy, but to learn through this destruction, they find base materials and reshape their atoms into something entirely new. The desire to create, learn, and prosper is not seen so cleverly anywhere else in the universe. These things are not our highest guarded resources. Nay, it is the human's imagination that has led our empire to success. Through their stories, they have made versions of every single being in the galaxy. Hawks, elves, machine intelligence, hive minds, galaxy-scale alien threats, deadly parasites, bacteria, 
and viruses. Through studying their all-encompassed culture, we have made defenses to every single threat imaginable only by them. When the great scourge arose, it was discovered that it was already present in human video games. We then found out what weapons were effective against it and prevailed. When one young species accidentally made a superintelligent AI, the humans once again had a story with a viable solution. We used Grey Goo to destroy all systems containing the AI and all it could spread to, then deactivated the machines. Without humans... Our best scientists predicted that we would have been exterminated by AI within 50 years of its creation. This is why we can't reveal ourselves to humans. We are bland, boring creatures, especially compared to the ones in their stories. We have no magic, wormholes, or hulking megastructures. Our technology hasn't made us some great power. We can't escape entropy. We can't launch some Hollywood invasion of any planet, but we are eternally grateful to the humans. For if they were not in existence, we most certainly wouldn't be either. Around their star cluster, we've enforced a total quarantine. Their minds must not be inhibited by our stale existence. In exchange for this, we protect them from the horrors they believe to be nothing more than the dreams of authors. One day... When they take to the stars, we will greet them with all we know. However, I'm certain that once such a day comes, we'll still have much more to learn from them than they do us. End of story. I just quickly want to thank the Tier 5 patrons and channel members, Alithia Barkey, Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnholtz, Albard and Gaster, Arcadian, Lord Azrakal, and Joe Kambaka.